Good day, friends in the Lord. Welcome to the third and last episode of our Catechetical and Reflection series, He Loved Us to the End. Saturday, we wait at the Lord's tomb with prayer and fasting. We meditate on the suffering and death of Jesus, as well as his descent into the place of the dead. We await the resurrection with hungry anticipation. Silence, gravity of demeanor, and recollection are the characteristic traits of Holy Saturday. These are external expressions of our awe and admiration at what Christ has done. In churches, the only sound that can be heard is the chanting of the Divine Office. The altar is left bare and the Holy Mass is not celebrated. Holy Communion is given only as viaticum to the dying. In many countries in Latin America, Holy Saturday is observed as a day of near absolute silence and of refrain from unnecessary movements. The only sacraments that can be celebrated are penance, and the anointing of the sick. Even funerals must take place outside Mass. On the sixth day, God completed all the work He had been doing, and on the seventh day, He ceased from all His work. The Church Fathers explain this passage in the light of Christ's mystery. Christ entered Jerusalem on the first day of the week to begin the work of new creation, completed it on the sixth day when he died on the cross and rested on Saturday from his work. Holy Saturday is the day of Christ's rest as he lay buried in the tomb. Here on earth there is silence because the Lord is buried, but in the place of the dead something awesome happened and an ancient homily describes this event. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent, as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from sorrow the captives Adam and Eve, he who is both God and the son of Eve. The Lord approached them bearing the cross, the weapon that had won him the victory. At the sight of him, Adam, the first man he had created, struck his breast in terror and cried out to everyone, My Lord be with you all. Christ answered him, And with your spirit. And he took him by the hand and raised him up, saying, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and for your descendants, I now, by my own authority, command all who are held in bondage to come forth, all who are in darkness to be enlightened, all who are sleeping to arise. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, 
For I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands. You who were created in my image, rise, let us leave this place. For you are in me, and I am in you. Together we form only one person, and we cannot be separated. For your sake, I, your God, became your son. The Lord took the form of a slave. I, whose home is above the heavens, descended to the earth and beneath the earth. For your sake, for the sake of man, I became like a man without help, free among the dead. For the sake of you, who left a garden, I was betrayed to the Jews in a garden, and I was crucified in a garden. See on my face the spittle I received in order to restore to you the life I once breathed into you. See there the marks of the blows I received in order to refashion your warped nature in my image. On my back, see the marks of the scourging I endured to remove the burden of sin that weighs upon your back. See my hands, nailed firmly to a tree, for you who once wickedly stretched out your hand to a tree. I slept on the cross and a sword pierced my side for you who slept in paradise and brought forth Eve from your side. My side has healed the pain in yours. My sleep will rouse you from your sleep in hell. The sword that pierced me has sheathed the sword that was turned against you. Rise, let us leave this place. The enemy led you out of the earthly paradise. I will not restore you to that paradise, but I will enthrone you in heaven. I forbade you the tree that was only a symbol of life. But see, I who am life itself am now one with you. I appointed cherubim to guard you as slaves are guarded. But now I make them worship you as God. The throne formed by cherubim awaits you. Its bearers swift and eager. The bridal chamber is adorned. The banquet is ready. The eternal dwelling places are prepared. The treasure houses of all good things lie open. The kingdom of heaven has been prepared for you from all eternity. Christ wasn't finished. After he died, he continued to go down, go down to the depths of humanity's darkness. He went to the place of the dead. Now that he won victory over sin and death, he went down to those who were imprisoned by death like a shepherd looking for his lost sheep. He brings with him his cross, the weapon of his victory. When Christ died, the place of the dead was shaken and the tombs of the dead were opened. From their tombs, the Lord called them, beginning with our first parents. And Jesus took them by the hand and brought them out. He descended into hell, into the place of the dead, to fetch those who have gone before. Christ's victory on the cross is for all humankind. Now that he has won, he reclaims those who were captured and imprisoned by death. And from there, he will rise again and eventually return to the Father, not only by himself. He will bring along all humanity to sit at the right hand of the Father. In the creed, we profess that on the third day, he rose from the dead. The Lord died on Good Friday. The, that is the first day. Holy Saturday is the second day. Now, in the biblical reckoning of time, days begin in the evening. That is why in the church even today, Sunday begins on the evening of Saturday, and we already celebrate Sunday Mass on Saturday evening. Masses on Saturday evenings are not anticipated Masses. They are already Sunday Masses. That is why also in the evening of Holy Saturday, it is already Easter Sunday, and the Church celebrates the Mother of all Vigils, the Easter Vigil of the Lord's Resurrection, the third and last part of the Sacred Paschal Triduum. The Easter Vigil is made up of five parts. The solemn beginning of the Vigil or Lucernarium, the Liturgy of the Word, the Liturgy of Baptism, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and the Concluding Rites. The Easter Vigil begins with the assembly gathered outside the church in the darkness of night. We all bring candles, like the servants in the Gospel parable in Luke 12, waiting for their master's return with lamps in hand. Some parishes begin at 8 in the evening, some at 9. The rule is that it should be dark already. A bonfire is then lit. 
The light of the world who rises from the dead pierces the darkness of the night and makes it as bright as day. The fire is a symbol of the light at the time of creation and of the light of the risen Christ. The blessing of fire, like the blessing of water, is meant to show that this material element is now an instrument of grace, a reminder of God's presence and intervention in our world. The primary symbol of the resurrection during Easter is the Paschal candle, and it is prepared. The celebrant traces the sign of the cross, the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, and the current year saying, Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, all time belongs to him in all ages. These words are a profession of the church's faith that by his resurrection, Christ has gained absolute dominion over all ages, over all time. He is the key to the Christian understanding of everything in the universe. The current year is written on the Paschal candle to signify that this year is also the year of the Lord. That is, it belongs to Him. The grains of incense are inserted into the candle. They are the symbols of the five wounds of Christ. By His holy and glorious wounds, may Christ our Lord guard us and keep at the procession, the deacon or priest proclaims Christ our light three times as he spreads the light around him from the Paschal candle. The Paschal candle now represents Christ who is our light. The procession is led by the lighted Paschal candle and it reminds us of the exodus of the chosen people. The column of fire guided them on the way towards the promised land. We too are guided by Christ on our exodus from slavery to sin to the freedom of God's people. When the assembly has entered the church, we all listen to the solemn proclamation of the resurrection, the exultate holding lighted candles. The exultate or Easter proclamation is the solemn proclamation of the resurrection that took place on this night. That is why the exultate focuses its attention on the night. This night was in fact the night of the Exodus, the night of baptism, the night of the resurrection. In other words, the Easter night is the compendium of the chief events that God has accomplished in us. With poetic indulgence, the exalted proclaims in words that show the immensity of God's love when He gave away His Son, as well as the immeasurable grace, thanks to Adam's sin, of having Christ as our Redeemer. It says, Father, how wonderful your care for us, how boundless your merciful love. To ransom a slave, you gave away your son. O happy fault, O necessary sin of Adam, which gained for us so great a Redeemer. Then follows the liturgy of the Word. The liturgy of the Word of Easter Vigil is special because it offers nine readings, including the Epistle and the Gospel. The readings are meant to give those preparing for baptism a final instruction on the history of salvation. For the faithful, these readings sum up the major works of God in the history of salvation, namely, creation, the sacrifice of Abraham, the passage through the Red Sea, the New Jerusalem, salvation offered to all, fountain of wisdom, a new heart and a new spirit. Finally, the epistle explains the meaning of Christian baptism, while the gospel proclaims that Christ is truly risen. Looking closely at the Old Testament readings, we are able to gather the chief topics, creation, exodus, church, universality of salvation, baptism as wisdom, and baptism as new life, or in short, creation and salvation. But the readings are not meant to be taken merely as a review of the things that God has accomplished in the history of salvation. The prayer that follows every reading affirms that what God did in the past, He still does today. That what He promised to Abraham and through the prophets, He now fulfills in the sacrament of baptism. The difference is that the fulfillment is more wonderful than the promise itself. The liturgy of the word is thus a narration of the story of God's love for us from the beginning. That same love He continues to give us today. Those who will be baptized will be incorporated into that history in the liturgy of baptism. 
After the last Old Testament reading, the Gloria is sung and the church bells are rung festively. After the epistle, the Alleluia is intoned solemnly. On this night, the Alleluia, which we have not heard since Ash Wednesday, will be sung again. From then on until Lent next year, the Gloria and the Alleluia will constantly remind us of this night of nights, of this mother of all vigils. Baptism and the Eucharist are the two sacraments that culminate our Lenten, Holy Week, and Easter Triduum observance. After the Gospel and the Homily, the Liturgy of Baptism will be celebrated. Adults will experience the complete initiation into the Church with the three sacraments, Baptism, Confirmation, and the Eucharist in First Communion. For us who are already baptized, we will renew our baptismal promises and get sprinkled with holy water. In baptism, we have been incorporated into the people of God to whom He showed and continues to show His love. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, we celebrate Christ's love to the end as we celebrate His resurrection. We all come to the table of Christ's sacrifice to partake of the meal of His body and blood, which binds us together as His Church. We are like the two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus, to whom the risen Lord appeared and explained the scriptures, and with whom the Lord broke bread. They recognized the risen Lord in the explanation of the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread, the same two parts in our Mass. We are an Easter people. We celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ, and we recognize the risen Lord in the Eucharist. The vigil concludes in the usual way that Masses are concluded, except that the dismissal and thanks be to God has Alleluia, Alleluia. Now let us reflect on the disciples who saw the risen Lord. After the arrest of Jesus, they all scattered and hid themselves. Only John and the women remained and followed Jesus up to his burial. The other disciples were scared. They could not face the risk of getting harmed or killed because of their association with Jesus. When he rose from the dead and he saw his disciples again, Jesus could have called them out for leaving him when the going got tough. But Jesus loved them to the end. When he rose from the dead, he told Mary Magdalene to tell his disciples to meet him. He showed himself to his disciples and even had breakfast with them on the shore of the lake of Lake Tiberias. He showed them his wounds, the proof of his love to the end. And when he returned to the Father, he sent them his Holy Spirit so that he will be within them until the end of time. What did this love do to his disciples? They found courage and proclaimed the gospel to the ends of the earth. They lived for Jesus and in the end, all of them died for Jesus. The converts that these disciples made were transformed into loving communities. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read, the whole group of believers was united heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions as everything they owned was held in common. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord with great power and they were all accorded with great respect. None of their members was ever in want, as all those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money from the sale of them to present it to the apostles. It was then distributed to anyone who might be in need. In the end, we must realize that Christ's love to the end is something that does not have an end. It continues every day, and we experience it in our daily lives. We are even instruments of this love. May our Holy Week and celebration of the Paschal Triduum make us a people who are always aware of Christ's love to the end, His love for each one of us. And may the crucified and risen Lord inspire and empower us to likewise love to the end. From us in the Campus Ministry Office, we wish everyone a happy Easter.